Top Tips Wednesday continues with your money, your call. Good evening and welcome to Your Money, Your Call for this, the Tuesday edition. I'm Evan Lucas from IGE. If you do have a question about shares, please pick up those phones. The phone lines are now open. Call on, on 1300 30 34 35. Or if you prefer, you can email us in at yourmoney at skynews.com.au. And with me on the panel, I am one of those that do like the social media out there. So you can use the Twitter hashtag YMYC. We are checking that as well. So please, if you don't want to use either of the others, pick up that as well. We will be following tonight. Joining me on the panel, we've got Michael Heffernan from Philip Capital and Carl Kapalungwa from Investor Systems. Welcome, gents. How are we? Thank you. Great to be here. Breathing regularly. As Breathing regularly. Is right. it's, um, it's quite a quiet week, which is very, from my point of view anyway, it's a, it's a little bit scary considering that at the moment we've got some interesting global factors playing onto it. Obviously, last night we saw iron ore hit a decade low. We saw copper continue to slide. We did see a nice pop in some of those industrial metals when, you know, obviously the issue around the sort of the mm -hmm. Russian war jet. Probably the start question that we need to have a look on for tonight is, how do we see Christmas going? Where do we see the, the year finishing? Where, what are we sort of interested in? I'm going to start with you. Sure. How, how are you seeing the market at the moment and what are you quite interested in? Yeah, look, I, I think flat to middling is probably the theme. I think we've dodged uh, some, some big bullets by not breaking below 5,000 um, over the last couple of months, despite uh, three or four attempts. Um, I think while we're holding 5,000 in the absence of any um, really terrible news, probably out of China, um, and any misfire with uh, a December rate hike by the Fed, um, there is scope for a very modest um, increase from here. Um, but I wouldn't get too excited given that um, we've had a bit of a lull, uh, I guess, in that uh, China revaluation thing. Um, I think that'll uh, pop up again probably earlier next year rather than later next year as, the, as people start to get more comfortable with the, with the idea that the Fed will raise um, fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so do you see a Santa Claus rally there for? Yeah, I think, I think, I think the, the, the environment's right for a bit of a rally, but I don't think you want to get too excited and put all the um, chips back on the table just at this stage. So I have to agree with you. Conservatively optimistic. Michael, to you, I know you're quite the, uh, quite the bull on, on, on the market and, and have been for quite a while. Where's your sort of take on where we are at the moment? I'd describe myself as a realist, Evan. Okay. Uh, I, I, look, I think the market hasn't been too bad at all, actually. I mean, we must remember that, uh, that last week we had five days in a row where the market actually went up 5%. Uh, and if you look at between September and now, the index has been around about 5,100. So We've, we've treaded water. Leading up to Christmas, uh, in my view, there's a few positive things. We have in the US, they've got their Thanksgiving Day tomorrow. Generally, uh, there's a bit of a rush on the, on the shops on the Friday following. If that uh, happens again, I think the confidence is going to be uh, quite positive uh, leading up to Christmas. We have our GDP figures coming out next week, mm -hmm. capital investment tomorrow. Yep. If they're on the, uh, on the positive side of neutral, I think that's an added uh, positive for us. Uh, it, Carl mentioned about the interest rate rise in the US. I think there will be one in December. But that's good because the central bank will be seeing that their economy is doing well and can warrant a rate increase. The question I have for you on that, I think it's, it's everybody's base case. I mean, if they didn't raise rates on the 16th, 17th FOMC meeting, the confidence shooting of the whole global market would be catastrophic in my personal point of view. My question is, next year, how many rate rises do you see coming out of the Fed? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the catastrophic comment. I don't think it will be. I think, I think we, we, we can From my point of view, it would suggest, that. therefore, that the Fed sees things about the US and global economy that the market doesn't see, and it's not positioned for that. And there would be quite a turnaround if they weren't to raise rates. All right, well, I guess we beg to differ on that one. Uh, the, the, the Fed have said on a number of occasions that any increase subsequent to so one it will be done very gradually. Mm -hmm. They've said that over and over and over again. And I think when you look look at the forecast of the various uh, Fed uh, uh, governors in the US who make forecasts every couple of months, they're expecting, I think in the next couple of years even, going out to 2018, they're still expecting interest rates to be around 3% or so. This is in five years' time. So I don't think we can look at any uh, amazing 70s and 80s resurgence 
in interest rates uh, over the next year or so. So all that uh, taken into account, I think uh, we're looking okay, and I'd say we'll have a, a positive run-up to Christmas. Carl, anything else to add before we go to our first uh, call of the night? Yeah, look, I think markets are fairly calm about what the Fed's doing, and I, I actually probably agree with Michael there. I don't think there'll be too much of a hissy fit if they don't, because it'll just delay the inevitable. Um, I do think the rates, if they don't go up in December, it'll be you know, January or whenever the next meeting is, the prob probably February, they tend to take a break over um, January. Uh, and how many rate rises next year? Well, don't forget, rate rises don't have to be huge, 25 basis points. You can have four of those easily and be at 1.25 or 1% uh, uh, by the end of next year, ballpark. Fair enough. We'll uh, probably touch on that over the night because it's certainly very much driving global markets, as I said before. So we will get on to our first caller. We've got Brett from Sydney. Hello, Brett. How are you? Oh, hi, Evan. How are you, mate? Very well. How can we Good. help you tonight? Mine's regarding Nick Scarley. Mm -hmm. um, looking at it, fantastic uh, return on equity, 40%. Looks good, low debt, future earnings are good, and also its uh, guidance for next year is another 20% growth on the previous yep. quarter. Uh, just technically and fundamentally, your thoughts? Uh, to me, it looks really good, yeah. Yeah, Nick Scarley is an interesting one, obviously, in that space, James, considering that obviously a lot of people are talking about JB Hi-Fi um, obviously moving towards home and, and having a look at that space with regards to moving into furniture, moving into that sort of area. You've also got Harvey Norman very clearly trying to tell you at their AGM yesterday that they have obviously seen quite a, quite a good change in the move over that period, particularly, again, down to their furniture size. Furniture does have much more gross margin in it than, you know, your typical sort of electronic retail and your apparel business. So that is what Nick Scully has. I somewhat agree with Brett in terms of where he is. It's a stock that's had a very good run-up. It's had very good sales. It is a confident stock, so be aware of that. Mm. I'm going to start with you first, Michael. Nick Scarley, your opinion, your outlook. I'll probably go on you on the fundamentals first, and then we'll probably yeah, look at the okay. next Okay, well, uh, with, with Nick Scarley, I, I suppose when, when one looks at stocks, uh, one uh, can always uh, think back to uh, a couple of years back when Nick Scarley had a pretty shocking uh, experience then. Uh, and I guess that tends to colour you after that. Uh, and so you always just uh, watch it very carefully. So even though it's got the fundamentals at the moment, I guess it's, uh, if you like, it's, um, it's 45 on the top... Uh, top 40 uh, as far as I'm concerned. I do prefer the other retailers which you've mentioned uh, uh, there Evan and yeah, Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi for example even uh, I think there's fantastic holdings also is not too bad in that area but just looking at the figures for Nick Scarley one thing it does have going for it, apart from the fundamentals, is momentum. Mm -hmm. And it has done enormously well. I'm just looking at the figures here. I think it's up 50% in the last year. So I'd rather buy stocks going up than going nowhere or, uh, yep. or going down. So on that basis, I'd be uh, willing to look again at Nick Scarley. Uh, of course, if the economy continues to improve, uh, in, in the uh, in, in the furniture business area, there, uh, because of all the building approvals that are going on at the moment, then Nick Scarley could be worth a look. So I think uh, Brett uh, yeah, could be a good one. Uh, I'll, I'll go and have a look at it a bit further. But as I said, it's not in my top clutch of retailers at the moment, but uh, could be if it keeps performing like this. Carl, to you on, on the same question. I'll, I'll leave you also on the fundamentals, and then we'll sort of talk about the chart as well. No, no, I'll pass on the fundamentals and stick to the chart, I think. <laughs> OK. Uh, the chart. You know, picture tells a thousand words, and if it was a really, really terrible stock with horrible things going on in the business, it wouldn't be bottom left, top right, and it is. So uh, that tells me that there are funds out there who are, are buying on a day-in, day-out basis. Uh, when the Dow's down 130 points, uh, the stock starts low, and they buy it to the end of the day, and it closes high. Uh, on good days, it's up. On bad days, it's, uh, it tends to be up as well, or at least flat. And what that leads to is uh, our performance over the broader market. And I think um, we're very much in a stock pickers market at the moment. Um, you can't just go and buy the top 20, top 50, top 100 or a basket like that and expect to do well. I think you have to uh, go and start digging. And the best thing you can do in that regard is find stocks that are outperforming the market. And this one's done it consistently over the last uh, six months. Uh, there's nothing else in the technicals which would suggest that this run can't continue. Yep. Um, there isn't any sort of serious um, volume coming at this stage, no supply at this level. Um, it's got a great short-term, medium-term, long-term trend. It's cleared four bucks. I think that's really important. Uh, often stocks can get a little bit stuck around some of those sort of round number Run round numbers, even it's only for a few weeks. Uh, we're through that, it's pulled back, it's held it, and it's going again. So, look, I'd, I'd be happy to um, add this to my portfolio around current levels. If I had it, I'd definitely stick with it. Um, I think you could have probably stop loss around this 365 level um, and be pretty comfortable with it. 
Yeah, no, I have to agree. No, I think we've all covered off on it. It's a, mm -hmm. It is one in that area that if you do want to sort of get away from the issue and exposure of electronics as a start at the top, top, it also doesn't have the same exposure like the electronics only do on the currency side as well. Yes, they do import materials, but it's one currency only, and that's the euro. So it's not as bad, and, and therefore the euro hasn't moved like the US dollar or the yen, which obviously has, again, been sometimes a bit of a headache. Clearly, Dick Smith is one to sort of look at in terms of that. It's not yeah. the main reason, but it is certainly part of it. So I think we cover that quite well. We'll move on to our next call then. We've got Anne from New South Wales. Hello, Anne. How are you? Oh, hi, Evan. I'm very well. How are you? Very well for a Wednesday night. How can we help you? Um, right. Well, look, um, I've got, I'm have got. i managing my FM, um, FF portfolio. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been looking at two stocks to hold for the medium long term. Yep. One is Flexi Group, mm -hmm. uh, FXL, and the other is Programmed Maintenance, okay. PRG. Yep. Um, I noticed that both trade on low PEs and have high yields. Okay. But I'm just wondering, should I be concerned about Flexi Group's debt equity ratio of 310%? Yep, okay, good questions and, and very good start in terms of what I was going to move to first with regards to Flexi Group. Obviously, if you are a follower of Flexi Group, it's uh, FXL. Uh, has had quite an interesting period over the last six months as um, what was a fairly good period over the last couple of years has, has really come back to hurt them because yes, their debt to equity is, is large. The other issue that's starting to see with them is that their distribution of funds, of, is also of, of revenue is also starting to be questioned. So I'm going to start on, on FXL because I think we probably would rather start on the slightly more negative stock than move on to the more <laughs> positive stock afterwards. Michael, to you first, Flexi Group, how do you see them? Well, it's not on my preferred list, let me tell you. Uh, it had some, uh, I think, uh, a diabolical time uh, would have been, what, about a year or two ago. Uh, we, we, if it's got a debt-to-equity ratio of uh, the figures, anything like the figures that have been mentioned, I think that would be a big uh, warning signal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I would, uh, I would be there, frankly. Uh, and the, the, the fact that, that, that Anne mentioned it had a, a, a good dividend yield, well, that's historical. That's based on what the dividends were compared to its current share price. Now, dividend yields go up when share prices go down. Uh, so that's what you've got to bear in mind. And if the yield is going up, not because they're paying more out in dividend, but simply because the share price has gone down, that is a real warning signal. A bit like BHP's dividend yield, high dividend yield. Why? Because the share price has yep. gone from 30 to below 20. So uh, Flexi Group uh, and would not be certainly one that I'd have in my uh, uh, portfolio uh, over the medium term. I think there's 2,000 stocks on the market, uh, and I think you can pick some ones that I think have got uh, uh, greater potential and sound fundamentals and, uh, than Flexi Group. Carl, same question, staying on Flexi Group. What's your opinion? What's, do you see an out for them? It's probably the question to sort of ask this is that where do you see the, the, the possible positives coming out of Flexi Group or none at all? No, again, I'm going I'm to pass on the fundamentals, Evan, just yeah. stick to reading the chart because uh, once again, the chart tells you everything. This, uh, the last one we looked at was bottom left, top right. This one's uh, top left, bottom right. So there's a, there's a hell of a lot of supply out there for the stock. It gets beaten down on the bad days, it gets beaten down on the good days for the market and there's not a lot of demand out there to push it back up. Uh, that gives you a pretty nice downtrend. It's um, probably about market perform over the last few weeks, but hey, the market uh, has been a bit, bit dodgy itself. Um, it's had a couple of false starts in the last 12 months. This is a second one. Potentially it could turn around, but I wouldn't touch it below 310 um, if I had it. Uh, I put a stop at 260. If I didn't have it, no, I wouldn't touch it either. Carl, sorry, I'm going to have to quickly interrupt. We do have to take a very quick break, and we will be back after the break to look at program maintenance. So if you are out there, please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35, back after this short break. Welcome back to the program. We are still taking your calls. Please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35, or email us in at yourmoneyatskynews.com.au or hashtag YMYC. Gents, just before we move on to the next call, obviously before the break, we were also talking about, about programmed and obviously he's looking out for a self-managed super fund. Very quickly, Carl, to you first, technically on programmed? Uh, yeah, look, it's pretty similar to that last one, Flexi Group. Uh, unfortunately, I have two of those in your portfolio, but I think the important thing um, for Anne is that, uh, like Michael said, there are so many other great stocks out there. Um, I think if you're holding on to something in both of these stocks' cases, which is probably flat to middling for the foreseeable future, I think b both Michael and I agreed on the first one. I'll see what he says on the second one. But um, there's an opportunity cost in, in a sideways market. There are better stocks out there. I'm sure we'll name half a dozen, uh, if not more throughout the course of the evening. Uh, if I had programmed, I'd 
be looking to exit if it dropped below 250. If I didn't have it, have it I wouldn't want to own it here. And very quickly to you, Michael. Uh, yeah, program doesn't shape up. It's not on my preferred list. Look, if you're looking for uh, a mid-cap stock, uh, and there's a smaller one that's come up uh, on my radar screen the last uh, uh, last few weeks, and that's called uh, SG Fleet, which is in the fleet management novated leases business, which had a big problem with uh, one of the Kevin Rudd taxation ambushes a few years ago. That seems to be off the agenda now. This stock has done particularly well. A mid-cap one that, uh, that has got all the fundamentals that I like. Aristocrat is another one report out today. If, you, if you're not opposed to gambling and gaming stocks, uh, Aristocrat stands out. There you go, and I think that's a, a way to sort of look at. It. Obviously, unfortunately, Flexi Group, particularly the three of us, are, are not in any are in agreement that it's not something you want to look at. Even from my point of view, programmed is also going through an interesting takeover at the moment with Skilled. So there is also the possibility that they will have to raise debt. There is a lot of talk about that, either through an equity raising or debt is not still confirmed. So just be aware there is a possibility of, of short-term headwinds again as that sort of hits the stock as well. So hope we answered your questions, but we do move on. We've got David from Brisbane. Hello, David. How are you? Good night. Thanks for taking my call. No problems. How can we help you tonight? Look, I'm in my 80s and I've got a reasonably diversified portfolio, mm -hmm. but I'm very underweight in IT and agriculture. I was wondering if the panel could suggest some stocks I might have a look at are more interested in growth than dividends. Okay. No, I don't want to leave any dogs for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. We, we, I think we'd all like that. Um, it's an interesting space at the moment, obviously, IT, and it's, a, it's quite diverse. It also depends on, on what you classify as IT. I mean, the one that everybody's getting excited about at the moment, obviously, is Atlassian, but unfortunately, that's listing over in New York. It will be the biggest IT company Australia's ever had, and it's what they call a unicorn, obviously, with the fact that it's, uh, it's worth one billion US dollars or more. So that's one to look at. You can get hold of it. You can go out there and have a, have a bit of a crack. I'm going to start with you, Carl. Is there any particular area of the IT space that you like technically before we move on to the next step? Uh, there's a couple of stocks which are uh, well, uh, e-merchants, ticker code EML, it's definitely uh, in that space, uh, payment solutions provider, um, prepaid sort of loyalty cards and things like that. Uh, I think technically they look absolutely fantastic, got a, a great trend um, and may also commend David on his uh, strategy of actually looking uh, out off the beaten track and out and thinking outside the square and actually putting some portion of his portfolio into these smaller mid smaller capitalization stocks and you can find some great stocks there with uh, consistent growing earnings and uh, great uh, dividend yields as well you don't have to always look in the top 20 or top 50 um, the other one is hub hub um, more of a financial services stock but uh, technology sort of flavor there as well i think vocus uh, in the communications also looks good so uh, hub and voc and eml3 really great looking um, tech flavoured stocks. Uh, in the agricultural space, uh, Ridley Corporation, I think RIC is the best looking one there. Yep. Michael, to you on tech space? On, on IT, look, none are uh, really on my list, but one that I have noticed is a thing called Technology One. Yep. TNE is the code. Uh, it shapes up on a lot of fundamentals. I'm just a little bit wary of IT stocks. I know they can go uh, really well. You had that uh, stock zero, for example, in the accountancy area, shot up to $40 and now down at 10 or $15. You've got to really watch them. Look good, but uh, be wary. Uh, you know, other ones in the quasi-technology space, like, uh, you know, you've got, you've got the internet stocks like realestate.com, uh, car sales, for example, very good. And if you want to extend beyond Australia, uh, you know, you can look at the tried and true ones like Apple and Facebook, for example. Yep. You can buy them. And I mean, they're, they're, they're giant killers. And Google, uh, you know, and, and, and brokers uh, uh, can deal in overseas shares for you. So, you know, don't overlook them as well. You can troll through our 2,000 stocks and find some smaller ones but uh, you've got these bigger ones there but technology one and those other ones I mentioned are ones that uh, I think you can look at David. Yeah, and I'd have to agree. I, if I was going to talk about technology, it would be overseas. Unfortunately, mm. I'd love, I'd mm. love not to. And that's why I started with that last. And if you do want to look at an Australian stock that is very, very exciting in the IT space, they are IPOing very, very soon. So please, very much have a look at that. That might be. But I, I agree with Michael. I, you can't go wrong with what goes on in Silicon Valley. They are tried and true. Particularly the old, what they call old media, which is an Apple, which is a Google. Even though they're only, you know, no more than two decades old at the absolute most. So that's probably where I, I would say you can very much get over there quite easily so that would be where I would look we do unfortunately have to move on I do apologize for that but uh, we do have another call online we've got Russell from Hobart hello Russell how are you 
Uh, good evening, thanks. Uh, I would just like to ask the gentleman their thoughts on the prospects for Transurban through to, say, the end of 2016, thanks. Yep, great question with what happened yesterday. I'm going to not talk about Transurban, I'm going to do that last, apologies, because um, I've got an overly positive view on it. I think I might skew a few people, so <laughs> I'm going to start <laughs> with you, Michael, on the fundamentals in terms of where yeah. Transurban sits. Yes, OK. I really like Transurban. I think it's been it's Australia's premier toll road operator. There just about isn't any other. I'm going to interrupt you. Isn't it the only one these days? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well, it's just taken over Bris Connect. So, and, and the thing is, it's bought them all at cheap prices. All these other people went and paid heaps for them. Yep. And there's Transurban sitting on the side, going picking up great values. Transurban, a great stock. It's going through a capital raising uh, at the moment, a rights issue yep. to fund, help partially. The beauty of it is that the discount was only 5%. I mean, normally in those kind of, but this is the beauty of it, the fact that because Transurban is so, so well managed mm. and so well run and the revenue that's there, mm. they're not having to offer you a 20%, 30% discount. No. Yes, from a shareholder point of view, it'd be nice, but it just shows you how strong they are. Oh, absolutely. It'd be a stock that I'd have in uh, as a core stock in a portfolio, frankly. Yeah. Carl, to you. I know you're going to love this too because the chart very much tells you. I think it looks really great. Yeah, definitely a bottom left, top right stock. I think importantly over the last ooh, six or so months, it's uh, put in a, a really great base pattern around about 10 bucks. And 10 bucks is just one of those, again, classic round numbers that you'll find where stocks uh, will hit and just find a little bit of supply. You'll have people that uh, got in at five and they'll sell at 10 for another reason. Just creates a little bit of supply, holds the stock down. Uh, once we work through that supply, then the stock can move quickly uh, from that zone. I don't think you need to buy it right now. Though. I think uh, it could go sideways for another six months, but if it breaks above, say, 1060 or so, uh, that's where I'd be looking to enter on momentum. There is another toll roads uh, group out there, Macquarie Atlas, MQA, uh, and I actually think they look better than TCL. Both of them look great, but MQA would actually be my pick out of the two right now. Mm -hmm. Just, and I, I'm going to quickly add my two cents. As I said at the start, I'm, I'm very positive on it. I have been for, for quite a long time. The, mm. the revenue stream is now pretty much assured in terms of the fact that obviously it's also got a lot of contracts with the mm. Government, particularly mm. here in Sydney with the expansion of you mm. know, the, the uh, City Cross to link up with the M5 and all that material. Mm. We now have got Briz Connects. It's expanding down in Melbourne. It is looking to get a lot. So, and then there's the, the US asset part of it as well with uh, 495. It's something that they always forget about with that express, mm. express lane, but it is growing unbelievably fast. Mm. Um, City Group call it Australia's only cash cow of their 100 cash cows globally, and there is a reason for that, and you can see it on their, on their revenue chart, EPS growth. The other thing about them, yes, okay, it's not fully franked if you're a dividend player, mm. but the dividend will always be relatively assured with the fact that it's a constant use asset. Um, I agree with Michael on the fact that they've got not only cheap prices, they've got file sale prices for mm. a lot of materials they picked up, so they don't have a huge amount of issue with the debt they've got on their balance sheet either. Ah. So what a fantastic stock TCL is, and, and it is certainly one to very much have a look at. I would agree also with Although right now, maybe not the chart. So maybe after the capital raising, you may see them come back into the nine handle. Not much, but you may see them back in there. That may give you a chance, because I agree, I think $11 come midway through next year is a very, very likely prospect. So I think we'll finish that on TCL. And unfortunately, with that, we do have to go to a very short break. Please, please pick up those phones, 1300 30, 34 35. We are taking your calls. So see you after the break with a couple more phone calls. Welcome back to the program. I'm Evan Lucas from IG, and joining me on the panel tonight, we've got Michael Heffernan from Philip Capital, and we've got Carl Kapalunga from Investor Systems. Gents, before the break, obviously we're talking about quite a diverse range of, of stocks, and, I, and I'm pretty sure we're going to get a few more about it. Just before we go any further, just want to have a very quick chat, um, a little bit about capital raising from TCL. I know there are mm -hmm. a few people that are asking that question. Just how it's structured. It's, it's a fairly simple one, this one. So just be aware that it's an entitlement offer. I'm pretty sure off the top of my head it's one for eight. I know there was a couple of people on the Twitter sphere that have asked that question. So just wanted to cover that off before we move on because there are some people. Out. It's a very, very simple offer. If you do have an opportunity to pick it up, you probably do want to have a, have a look at it. So um, just wanted to cover that off before we go any further. And we do actually have another call on the line. We've got Helen from Melbourne. Hello, Helen. How are you? Hello, Helen. Hello, Helen. 
Helen, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Hello, Thank you very much. Um, look, um, I have Santos shares, mm -hmm. and I've just been given the option to take um, up more at 385, and yes. I noticed today they're only 417. Mm -hmm. um, I feel a bit sceptical, mm -hmm. and it means if I take them up, I've got to put quite a lot of money back in, and I really... And I also have Transurban, so I'm definitely taking up those. Yeah. I just want to know what your thoughts are on taking up the Santos options. Okay, good question. Uh, and leading on to it, Helen, I, you can hear in your voice, and uh, I probably agree with you, and I know probably the two panellists on my left here will do as well. The hesitance in Santos is is justified, um, and it is, it is very real in terms of why you are not the only person out there looking very very hesitantly at what's going on at what is probably now the, the poorest oil asset in, in, in the mid-cap space that we have. Um, it, it's Assets are very good at 75 to 100 US a barrel, but we are obviously a country mile away of that at 43. Uh, and on an internal rate of return, Gladstone, which was their absolute key project, um, is a horrible project at current price. Let's, let's, let's not sort of skirt around the bush. So first question, obviously, before we come to Carl on the technicals, because I'm pretty sure I can, I can hear him already <laughs> saying what he's going to see on the technical level. Michael, to you, the question was around the rights. What would you do as a shareholder around the possibility, obviously, of a 30% discount to the VWAP, which I think was around about the 30th of October? Top of my head, don't quote me on that, but mm. well, as the caller said, as Helen said, it's already 417. Mm. It's another, what, 15% lower at $3.85. Would you take them up, or how would you manage your current situation in Santos, considering their outlook and where they're at? Let me put it this way. I'm uh, not favourably disposed to the oil and gas sector full stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, m my view is that I would have got out of it. But that's not the case with Helen. She's yep. got the sound. I don't think I'd be taking them up. I, I don't think I'd be taking them up because my view on the oil and gas sector is not favourable. Even though you're getting it at a bit of a discount, I think you can put your money into other things, I think, that'll get you a bit of a, a better return. You might say, OK, you're buying it at a bit of a discount uh, to what it was before or getting it at a discount to what it was before. But it's it's a, a whole lot down from where it was uh, a year ago. So I'm going to push what, you on this. Yeah, okay. How would you manage it? How would you manage Helen's position? I know this is a little bit further on for the question, but if you were in Helen's position, OK, we're not going to take up the rights. How would you manage now the fact that you've got what sounds like a very big loss-making position? Uh, the, the, the rights trading is finished, is that correct? Uh, let, let's just ignore the rights. Let's say you don't take them up and obviously you, you, you trade them out. How would you deal with the rest of the position that she has? Uh, look, I would be inclined to move on, okay. frankly, uh, and, and look at else, look elsewhere. I mean, sometimes you've got to rule the book and you've got to say, is Santos going to do, uh, to do better than the Bank of Queensland, for example, mm -hmm. over the course of the next year? I think the Bank of Queensland will do better, so I would move out of Santos and put it into the Bank of Queensland. Yeah. And that's what I think the, 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 almost the question answer is, is that is your opportunity cost... Mm being matched by crystallising what is a large loss and using that money somewhere else. That's and right. I think that's the, the, the way to answer the next part of the question. Tough, tough uh, decision. Carl, I'm going to come to you very quickly on Santos because I know very clearly what the chart shows and I'm pretty sure most people out there does. How, how do you look at this position on a technical level and how would you actually probably trade the situation now? Yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think there's a trading opportunity here. Um, it really has all the hallmarks of a dead cat bounce and I'd Maybe not all the callers are familiar with the, the concept, but something uh, falls from a, a great height and doesn't bounce very high, hence the term dead cat bounce. Uh, it looks very similar to the way it did almost 12 months ago in November when obviously the, uh, the bad news started to come out, had that big drop. Uh, huge volume, huge turnover, a lot of people jumping in straight away thinking, well, what a bargain, Santos was a $13 stock, now it's half price, uh, I'm going to buy it and it'll bounce a few bucks and I'll get out and I'll give myself a big pat in the back. Uh, months and months go by, there's no bounce, uh, they get a bit tired of this position, they toss it out and you get that next spill down. Uh, and often when you, 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 you hit a level, there's huge volume turnover and you don't bounce, it's the worst thing possible because you've got all these, all these dead wood stuck in the stock. And we're creating the same thing again. So it's dropped from $7 sort of May, June, back to about $4 more recently and huge, huge volume um, over the last few months as well. So a lot of people again churning into this, churning out of it. I don't think there's a lot of um, accumulation. I don't think there's a lot of funds come in saying, hey, look, this is rock bottom now and we're taking a position. Um, there, there's very little upside. Uh, in The price action is showing very little upside to suggest that. So if I had the stock, 
I think Michael's right. I, I think you've, you've got to just draw a line under it and stop thinking that this one's going to go from 4.17 to 8.34 in the next six months. Um, I think some of the other stocks, uh, even that hub or EML, they're more likely to double in the next uh, six months than this one. So, um, yeah, look for a, a fresh start in a different place. Oh, and I think that's the, the best way to sort of sit with the original question, which obviously with the rights, we don't believe you should take them up and actually look at even possibly crystallising your position and, and looking there. Obviously talk to your advisor, but that, that's clearly how we all think it, it currently where Santos is at. It is unfortunately a very horrible story what's happened over the last 18 months to, to that stock and where it currently sits in the oil and gas space. We, are, we have another call on the line. We've got Cathy from Victoria. Hello, Cathy, how are you? Evan, I'm well, how are you? Oh, I'm very well for a Wednesday. How can we help you? I just, um, I know you touched on Transurban a little while ago. Mm -hmm. I missed out on that one quite some time ago. And I'm yep. just wondering if the Quarry Atlas Group is a good substitute for Transurban. Okay. Thank uh you. Thanks, Cathy. Obviously, the, when we were talking about tra uh, Transurban before, we, I'm going to go straight back to Carl on this. Obviously, it was a stock you mentioned pretty much straight away as, as the other one, and, and one that you believe is probably the right opportunity in this current space. Do you want to just sort of expand a bit further for, for Cathy and those that missed the segment before? Sure. I don't know if uh, Cathy's still on the line. I hope she is. But I'm just curious as to uh, this idea of, that she's missed out on TCL. Yeah. Um, I guess TCL's a $10 stock. Macquarie's a $4 stock. Um, and uh, forgive me if I'm assuming incorrectly here, but I don't think you can say TCL's twice the price of Macquarie and therefore I missed out on TCL. I think TCL's, uh, if you can get through that 1065 level, is just beginning to go from 10 to 15 or wherever it might go next. Um, so I don't think you've missed out on TCL. Uh, reiterating what I said before, if I had to pick one of the two, TCL or MQA, I would I prefer MQ at this stage. Um, it is moving, it's motive. Uh, it has had a wonderful base pattern similar to TCL uh, within the sort of going back three months for about 12 months before that. But it's moving, it's motive. I like to buy things uh, on the up. Uh, TCL still working through its consolidation phase. Uh, this MQA is blitzing the market in terms of performance. So it's, it's dramatically outperforming the broader market. Um, the, all the volume characteristics, the price action characteristics suggest that this can go higher. There's nothing at all on the chart which, which would suggest that this run is about to come to a, a close. So I'd be happy to, to run out and buy it uh, tomorrow morning at the open. Uh, I think you can run a really um, tight stop loss on this around about sort of 370 and uh, which gives you less than 10% or about 10% downside and unlimited ups upside and they're the sorts of trades I like to get into. I think that's a perfect way to answer the whole thing. We've obviously covered why we like you know the TCLs of this world. It, it's an it's a stock very much that is poised for that, that movement. I'm actually going to sort of leave that there because I think we've covered it really well. I've got a couple of Twitter questions that I'm going to put to both panellists. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with you, Michael. The first question is from Alan Morgan, and he writes, what is the panel's thoughts on TOX solutions? Very quickly, what's your, what's your outlook on TOX? It's looking better than it did a few years ago. Uh, again, it's not quite in the top 20, but uh, uh, it's there and thereabouts. So it's worth another look. Uh, I think it's momentum, momentum. Uh, it's, it's progressively uh, uh, moving in the right direction, as you can see on the chart in very recent times. Uh, but I'd, I'd look a bit more carefully before I'd be jumping into it, frankly. Mm -hmm. Carl, question on TOX? Yeah, look, it, it's not my favourite at the moment. Uh, it's not the worst looking one out there, but it uh, doesn't fall in the category of a, a screaming buy at this stage. Uh, there are some signs uh, that some demand is coming into the system. Uh, there's an outside chance that we've seen the lows uh, back in November 14, around 220, and we could see some appreciation. But I think it'll be a hard slog from here. So um, you may well go from 290 into the mid threes but uh, it'll, it'll yeah, be waste, a bit of a grind. Waste management at the moment is a tough business. Um, yeah, well, it is tough. This week, because Tox was involved with the mining sector as well. So be a bit careful. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think that's the other thing to sort of then look at is you can sort of somewhat touch on TSI to a point. Mm -hmm. You can also look at Sims Metals mm -hmm. um, and obviously their waste management sort of isolation and the fact that they're recycling. Yeah. So. It's a tough space, I must admit, it's not one that really grabs me as one no. that I should be sort of looking right. at as, as a space. The next, the other question that I sort mm. of want to talk about, because it is an interesting one, I have noticed since it sort of came about that it's becoming a little bit more of a regular sort of question we're getting here on your money, your call, and that's from David Kirby, and he does write, do you believe ERI and MMJ are well placed to be market leaders in the future of the Australian cannabis industry? Now, the reason I raise this is because obviously medical marijuana and medical cannabis in the US is absolutely exploding. If you look at some of the listings, over on particularly the NASDAQ, they are very, very prominent. 
E MMJ is the one I'm going to concentrate on because that's the one that grabs everybody's attention. Now, you may have actually seen it when it originally listed as PYL, which is Prioritech. Now, everybody got very excited by the idea that we were finally seeing the first chart sign of actual medical marijuana coming on to our listing. What I didn't like about it, and yes, it's a very exciting story to some point, what I didn't like about it is the raising was only five million bucks, and inside five months, they've changed hands already and had to merge. The business is very, very strained and very much on the caveat that they can get into the US and actually draw revenue from there. So the way I would answer this question, it's an interesting sector. I understand why it's very eye-catching. Obviously, it is a very gray area in the, in the medical industry. Mm. Um, what I would say is that the companies are very, very exploratory, I think is the word, and very, very speculative. They are very much two cent stocks for a reason, um, and their raisings are very, very, very small. They are more likely to see headwind pain and more likely capital raisings than any form of growth. So just be aware, I understand the excitement behind it, but from my personal point of view, these two have a long way to go before you can actually call them any form of excitement or, or any form of actually being the, the future of the Australian cannabis industry. Could be proven wrong, completely open that, but the raisings are so small, we're already seeing these mergers and acquisitions to sort of sustain the company going and they've only been around listed for six to seven months. So that is my take on, on that question in terms of that. Jens, is there any sort of take that you have on, on that industries or? I'd agree completely with what you're saying. I mean, you know, for something to raise $5 million and then they change hands, I mean, what sort of company is this? Exactly. We're talking about, and the thing about medical mar uh, marijuana, I don't think it's even got through all the uh, legislative period yet to enable the thing to be actually uh, going into production in this, yep. in this country. So profit is a long way off. Uh, so it, you'd, you'd put it in the big S speculative category, <laughs> so you'd be very, very wary of it. And if, look, it's a punting stock. If you want to have a bit of a punt, uh, go on. Go and, go and do it, but be prepared to lose all your dough uh, in case it goes wrong. May not, may go up, but go to the US. Yeah, exactly right. And with that, we're going to actually move on to our first email question tonight, and we've got that from Anne, and Anne asks, what does the panel think of Slater and Gordon? At current prices, do you think it can come back, or will it continue to fall? Well, considering it's had 42% decline since last Thursday, and the fact that everybody is questioning what they told you at their AGM about whether or not they can actually meet their current forward guidance with the debt level that they're currently seeing, and the fact that you've got Quindell as being the millstone is a very interesting one. I must admit, I'm not going to talk about Slater and Gordon. Um, I, I've been fairly prominent about saying that I actually thought the Quindale deal was one of the worst things I've actually seen. Um, the 10.4 times earnings for a, an industry that is very fragmented in the UK to get 50% of your earnings from it was a risk to start with and they obviously raised a heck of a lot of money at the top of the market and have obviously seen a, an unbelievable fall from $8.15 to, to where we are today. I'm going to start with the technical side because I think Michael and I are going to have some quite interesting chats here. Carl, you first on the technical perspective. How do you look at a chart like Slater and Gordon when there's been two very dramatic declines? Yeah, I think, I think the key from here will be uh, two, th well, two things, volume and, and price action. So uh, this thing is going to keep falling or it'll be flat to sideways unless you see a big spike in volume and a big move up. You, you've got to have the two together. So uh, big spike in volume as we discussed with... Um, uh, the other one that was terrible, um, I can't recall. Santos, is it? Santos, yes. that's right. Big spike in volume and flat is the worst case scenario. Big spike in volume and a big rally at the same time, uh, then, then there's something good might happen because often what's happening there is you've got that exhaustion supply coming to the market, the last person to hang on saying it's it's going to be all right, then the next day they decide, no, it's not, they're, they're out. Uh, and the fact that it, so there's turnover, the fact that it rallied means somebody got in and was seeing some value there and was happy to chase uh, the last bit of supply uh, to get set. And then often they'll go sideways for a while and, and then creep up after that. Um, it's too early to tell here, you've got the big move down, that's the first part of it, on the big volume, but uh, it either gets back up to three bucks really quickly and then I might start to look at it as a very risky turnaround play. Uh, until then, I think you uh, avoid this one like the plague. Having said that, I could be completely wrong. You know what, in uh, 12 months time, it could be four bucks and I'm happy to be proven wrong by saying don't touch it here. Just too risky. Michael, to you. Slater and Gordon. I think there's a number of things here. Uh, one, uh, management have never resiled from the fact that their uh, English purchase is going to be earnings per share accretive. They have not resiled from that on many separate occasions. Even in their commentary at the AGM, restated that their, their guidance uh, that they gave before uh, was still on track. The institutions and short sellers can go and do what they like. 
management have said that. I tend to believe them. You know, the thing that I look at, Evan, when you look at the, uh, the demolition of a share price, to use that expression, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, its share price now is lower than what it was before it went uh, into the Quindell business in England. So it's almost saying that what they did in England is worth nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Yep. And, and the thing about legal firms, uh, I've also got legal qualifications, I might say, I've, I've been involved in lawyer, legal firms, so they know what the cases are that they've got. They know that they're on, you know, how many they've got there. So they should have a pretty good idea of what the revenue is likely to be coming for. Now, I know there's been arguments about where you put the work in progress and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But if you know what cases you've got, then, uh, you know, that gives a greater degree of certainty to the uh, revenue that's going to flow. Now, there have been some comments that uh, they made at their AGM that the English situation was not going quite as fast as what they had hoped. So maybe that will reduce it a bit. Uh, I'm not sure, sure how much. But what Slater and Gordon have indicated is that their earnings before interest and tax and all that through the English acquisition is almost going to be almost two or three times what their earnings are currently in Australia. Now, uh, you can say, I don't believe it, which some people are saying, hence it's share price. I don't tend to be in that camp. Um, I, 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 when the English thing happened, uh, I thought it sounded a, a good deal. Then you had all the arguments about Quindell, the parent company, having issues. You had issues with ASIC about looking at its accounting uh, uh, situation. But there was nothing that changed. OK, it's bottom line, profit, uh, bottom line profitability in my book. So in other words, if you got Slater and Gordon, I'd be holding. OK. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there because we do have to go to a quick break. It'd be interesting to discuss this even further. But we are having to take that quick break. Please pick up those phones, 1330, 34, 35, back after this short break. Welcome back to the program. If you have a question about shares, please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35, or if you prefer your money at skynews.com.au, or as you've seen on the hashtag YMYC. We will move on to that next caller, thankfully. We've got Emma from Sydney. Hello, Emma, how are you? Very good. Lovely to see Super Boy on four. <laughs> and just I'd uh, like to know about <laughs> A2M from yeah, Crazy it's, Nuts uh, Three Days. Yes, it has. It's been going incredibly and crazy. And compare Balamix, it's consistently up. Yeah. And whenever you have time, can you please look at uh, Sydney, uh, Sydney Airport yes. and PE gone to 100? Are you still buying or okay. selling now? Several questions there, which, which is actually good because this actually links up, Emma, with, with some of the questions I've actually got on Twitter as well. So. I'm actually going to start with your A2 question because that's obviously the one that a lot of people are watching um, and we'll throw Bellamy's in there as well because I think that's obviously very interesting in terms of that whole space. The questions I've got on Twitter are can we have a look at a technical view first? So I'm going to start with Carl. Let's have a look at the technical view on A2 and also Bellamy's and how sure. you'd probably tr trade it and what you'd do with it. Yeah, I look, I think um, uh, A2 is probably going to take a little bit of a break here if, uh, if you not familiar with the stock, uh, it's had a big run up from 70 into about $1.15, uh, back to just under a dollar today. Um, but uh, you know, technically, structurally, the, the trend uh, looks constructive. Uh, I would suggest that the last couple of days in terms of price action, so big run up um, on uh, sorry, Tuesday, uh, and then and then coming off those highs uh, on a big volume spike, and then today's big black candle uh, on extra volume, I would say, has just killed this trend for a little while. I don't think the trend's completely over. I just don't think uh, if you're speculating you need to be in it right now. Uh, I'd be looking for an equal and opposite price action signal to that. So it might be a, a, a down day. It starts, uh, starts fairly steady but sells off uh, during the day and closes quite high, uh, followed by what we call a confirmation day the next day where it actually uh, starts steady and closes high. So if you can see that opposite price action signal, that would be the time for me to enter uh, might be sort of around 105 to 110 on the way back up. On uh, Bellamy's, I think that's, uh, yeah. ooh, I don't know if this is the right word, the safer play. Uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, if you can call any of these plays safe. Um, you know, oh, look, I'm a true technical analyst, so uh, stop telling me about the story and telling me why it's going up. It's going up, so I want to own it. Um, I, I'd, I'd be quite happy to own Bellamy's at this point in time. Uh, there's absolutely nothing in the charts to suggest that this, this run won't continue. Uh, highly prospective, I think, in terms of uh, 
the, the candles, the, the volume, the outperformance. Uh, and the other one I'd throw into the mix at the moment, um, which is I think going to be very good if it breaks through $6, is Bega. Mm -hmm. uh, BGA, which has just entered this uh, space more recently, uh, and I think um, I don't think you could do too wrong with Bellamy's or BGA, and maybe your specy is the um, A2M. Mm -hmm. Michael, powdered milk, powdered milk, baby, get, baby formula, in fact. Get, get excited. Well, I think you will, uh, certainly with Bellamy's, because there's a relationship there, uh, Blackmore's connection with Bega, for example, so it's all, it's all in there. But Bellamy's are the baby Formula One. They, they were the ones who kicked it all off. And apparently uh, uh, China is going very well for them. And, and, and uh, people, the, uh, a lot of people from China who are living here in Australia apparently like it as well, uh, and like Blackmore's as well, mm -hmm. uh, because of the quality angle. The thing I like about Bellamy's, is, is at least it's making money and making a profit. Not too sure about A2M, might, uh, but B Bellamy's has got a better track record. Not quite sure that A2M is in the baby formula thing as well, whereas Bellamy's definitely is. Bega uh, and Blackmore Connection is going to be looking at the baby formula thing. That is the, the real growth area is the baby formula. Just on that, I'm just going to interrupt you. They couldn't have timed that announcement, that joint venture announcement, better if they tried, because the day after was when the Chinese government announced that the one-child policy oh, right. was ending. So That's right. that yeah. was, that was yeah. just to interrupt you, that yeah. was the amazing thing about it, because, yes, it is mm. a very, very massive growth industry, and, and they couldn't have timed it better. Sorry, yeah. I'll keep well, going yeah, on that. Yeah, well, I agree. So, yeah, I, I would be going for Bellamy. So I think you take more of a punt, as Carl said, with A2M. You can see the chart there uh, and I'm not sure about its fundamentals what profits it's got I know Bellamy's has got a high PE ratio but so too has Blackmore's always had and Blackmore's has gone up 400% in the last year uh, but it's still it's got very strong growth so yeah. it's a, it, look I, I, I'm, I'm with both I, I, I think that if you wanted to go, and let's just sort of just for argument's sake, if you want to look a little bit longer that maybe have a little bit more value in it, I'm with Carl in saying that maybe bigger is your option. Because somebody would some people would argue that Bellamy's has has, has done its dash and in terms of getting that dramatic upside that they've obviously got, you, you you will probably slightly miss on. So maybe if you want to look on a longer term, the entry one is bigger because it's probably the one that hasn't had the upside yet. Unfortunately, we do have to take a very, very short break once again. We will be back. It's into the last half hour of the show. Please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35. Welcome back to the program. We are still taking your calls for another half an hour. We are into that last half an hour of the program. It's been a very good program so far. Please, please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35, or send us an email at yourmoneyatskynews.com.au or tweet us in on the hashtag YMYC. We are answering the question, or answering the questions tonight, obviously on the panel. We've got Michael Heffern from Philip Capital and Carl Kapalunga from Investor Systems, and I'm Evan Lucas from IG. Gents, very good program. Let's keep it going. Let's, let's hope we get more questions about things like powdered milk, et cetera, because they're actually interesting, um, rather than sort of something about Santos. So let's hope and let's see. <laughs> Next call on the line, we've got Debbie from Brisbane. Hello, Debbie, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? Very well. How can we help you on this Wednesday night? I would like to ask you about rent.com.au. Mm -hmm. um, are they the next REA? Ooh. I will tell you that I am a real estate agent and I think that they are onto something okay. um, because they offer a service for not only real estate agents but also property managers to allow, yep. so, sorry, private landlords to do their own background checks. Yep. And I think they're onto something and the share price has gone from 20 cents to I think 38 in the last two weeks and I'd just be interested to know what the panel thinks. Very good question, Debbie, and it's obviously good that you obviously got research. Clearly, that's what you've got there in terms of, of how you look at rent.com.au. I would actually probably almost compare them to Domain um, in terms of how their, their offering is because they are very much uh, on, a, on a sort of a, a software level at the same level. That, that, that is a very good thing to say because obviously Domain now is very proud of the fact that they are considered possibly the, the number one, obviously inside Fairfax. It's all Fairfax can tell you in terms of their good news stories. The fact that Domain is, is just an amazing product in terms of what it's offering. I'm going to start with you, Michael, because it's the, the fundamental question, obviously, was what Debbie was, was raising. Do you see rent as the REA of now? You'd, I'd have to look at it further because I don't know it in great detail. Yep. It's only been listed for 
what, uh, about six months or so? Yeah, about right? that, a little bit longer, yeah. So I'd need to, I'd need, I, I like to buy things after they've got a bit of a track record. I don't, I don't get phased uh, by the fact it's gone up so much since it lists. I like to see some evidence of what it's actually doing, mm -hmm. uh, what its profits are, what its uh, future growth forecasts are, uh, before I'd really commit it to, unless there was a lot of background information that I had uh, before the thing listed. Uh, so on that basis, I'd put it to one side. I want more time to, to look at it. I see what it's done, that's very good. Whether it'll be a new REA, I'm not sure, but REA, what frankly, a is a great stock. What a great a stock. 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 Absolutely. It's got, it's got fantastic growth prospects as well, and I certainly wouldn't hesitate about buying realestate.com. Carl, to you. It's an interesting one chart-wise, I know that. <laughs> so it, looks, it looks very interesting. Yeah. Uh, look, honestly, I, it hasn't come up on any of my scans. It's probably not meeting the liquidity filters. Uh, if you do go back anything more than three months, in fact, there's absolutely no way it would have met any of my liquidity yep. filters because it's so sketchy. Uh, there were days where it barely trades or doesn't move. Very little volume at all. That's all changed in the last three months. Uh, obviously, somebody's figured it out or some funds, uh, small cap funds, uh, have done the research and, uh, and have started to accumulate. Uh, they need to get rid of the dead wood, the dead wood being the people that have been stuck in this stock for years uh, when it's done nothing or whatever it was that backdoored, that was backdoored into this thing. Uh, they, they've got to get them out. It, they, by, by no, they're definitely doing it. Uh, this looks great. I'd be happy to own this. It is not a uh, uh, I think Michael earlier you said TCL would be a cornerstone of your portfolio. Don't make this one a cornerstone of your portfolio. Yeah, okay? I would agree with that. Um, it's definitely a specky one, uh, but if you're looking for a specky stock right now, this has really got me very interested, and I would be happy to. It's uh, very to small. It. I'll give you that. So the just the heads up, obviously, Debbie, be aware the market cap of it is minute, um, and, and I mean it's which, it's sub 10 mil, which can um, work in its favour as well. Yes, because, it can. You know, it's illiquid. It, it becomes the flavour of the month. It goes from 40 to 80 really quickly, and you've got a great trade. What, what probably caused the explosion? Oh. Yeah, what caused the explosion back in, in October was was the the change of software and the software updates and that's what's got everybody very excited and you can see it originally happened around the end of September they did sort of do a lot of relistings and backdoor terms and by the by it did change itself and that's what's caused that 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 switch and that's why there's excitement it's as we've all said, it's got the software now that they believe will mimic what comes on at, dom at domain. The issue with it is that it is very small. What is more likely to happen is probably a takeover. Yeah. Um, and I think that needs to be probably the way to answer it from my perspective is that a stock that small with the players like REA Group yep. and like Domain, Domain particularly has a habit of picking up players like this, look what they've been doing over the last sort of 24 months. If the software continues to show that it is actually going in the right direction, mm -hmm. they will bolt that into their, their current offering. And that would be my conclusion conclusion about where they could end up being. Uh, it, it, I'm sorry, you go. If you wanted to rent a house, would you look at rent.com or would you look at realestate.com? I think it's a little bit different. And what I mean by that, in the fact that obviously as Debbie alluded to, the software now allows you as a private citizen to actually do your background checking, do your renting, etc., in terms of who's getting there, rather than having to go down an agency yep. side, um, which is a little bit different to what REA and Domain offer you. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a bit chalk. You know, it, it's, oh. it's sort of apples, oranges, maybe. Cole, Cole. Oh, look, I was just going to say, uh, you know, they've got some great things going on with the software being in place, as you said. But more important than that, as a trader for me, it's on the radar. It's on other investors' radars. Yep. They're going to be looking at it. They're going to be thinking about buying it. Eventually, they'll tip over and do it, and that's going to push the price up. I think it looks really interesting here. So there you go, Debbie. I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. It is an exciting risk prospect, and I think I need to yep. really put that in. Risk prospect. Keep an eye on it. As we all said, don't put your absolute house inside it, excuse the pun, um, but very much have a look at it. So I think we'll leave it from there. We've now got Richard on the line from Sydney. Hello, Richard. How are you? Good, how are you? Very well. How can we help you tonight? Good, I don't think you can help me. I've got two stocks for you. One is Yowie Group, mm -hmm. that's stock code YOW. Yep. And the other one is DFM, yep. Dong Feng. Dong Feng, yep. Interesting questions. Obviously, uh, Yowie is very much one of those stocks out there that is a bit of a favourite on, on, on the Your Money, Your Call plays. Um, very much, everybody got very excited by the fact that Walmart signed them up over, obviously, what was going on with... Uh, oh, I just had a massive metal blank. What's the uh, major Swiss company the, with the, the uh, eggs? Kinder Surprise. Thank you very much. Kinder Surprise, that's the one. And obviously that was a, a big explosion, the fact that obviously they had 
Walmart entry into the US, mass entry immediately, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, revenue looks very much assured, except all of that idea. Yowie has had an interesting period since um, as they've started to try and to, to integrate it. I'm going to probably ask the first question for you, Carl, because the initial bounce was justified. The excitement was very much justified. We've now got to a point where it looks like, from a chart perspective, it's got stuck, I think is the way to yeah, explain it to absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah, look, and that, that's a really good description. It's had a good run, it's got stuck, and all the people that uh, bought it thinking it was going to be the next best thing have been slowly, gradually getting out of it mm -hmm. because it's not. Uh, it'll need some use, it'll need a catalyst, it'll need uh, some results, and honestly, I don't think, given that this is again not one of those cornerstone plays, it's one of those specky ones that you have in your portfolio, I wouldn't be bothered with it from that perspective. There's, just go with the last one, RNT. So sell this one and buy RNT as your spec play. Yeah. Michael, to you on Yowie, because obviously it's very interesting because I there was a question of what Carl just answered that, that caught my attention. That's what I was going to say. That is the next set of upside to it is results. You've had this amazing announcement that they've obviously signed on with Walmart. Now they actually need to produce. What's your thought on Yowie's? Yeah, well, they've got to come out with results. Clearly, they've got to put some uh, some dollars on the bottom line. Uh, that's what really counts. Uh, I know my uh, my grandson likes Kinder Surprises, so <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. Uh, but no, as, as an investment, uh, I think I'd uh, uh, put it on the interchange bench at the moment. Okay, yeah, and I think that's sort of how I, I look at it too. I I want to see that this Walmart deal is actually offering a return. Um, and I agree with you, Carl. When I look at that chart, I get really nervous going, yeah. well, why has it got stuck there? Why, what has happened to it? And I agree. You can see the volume is starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger, that people are starting to think, hang on a minute, this <laughs> may not be as good an opportunity as, as it originally was. I've got my initial return because obviously you would have, you've actually probably got 50%. I mean, most people were, that were getting excited about Yowie bought in around the 50 cent handle, 60 cent handle, because you would have got that over the year. So it's been a fantastic player over the year, but uh, just getting to a point where I'm just sort of not seeing the momentum anymore to really pile into it. So uh, I think that's also my opinion on, on Yowie as well. We actually do have another email on, on, the, uh, on the board. We've got Nick who writes in, Hi panel, I'm holding AMP shares and I am considering offloading them to buy into the aged care sector. Do you think this is a good idea at current prices? That's an interesting question. That's um, a financial services stock to move into healthcare slash aged care centres sort of area. Um, maybe not the one stock that I'd be using as a funding source, but interesting. Let, let's sort of go go with that. Michael, to you first. What's your phone? Mm. Let, let's just ask the question: Aged care stocks. Which are you looking at? Well, I'm not looking at any in particular. I'm looking at the health stocks that you mentioned, mm. uh, and that's Ramsey uh, Healthcare is a standout one for me. Uh, and I'm looking at other medical stocks, but none in none in the aged care area per se. No doubt there are some. I have worries about areas of the economy where the government has a lot of involvement. Now, with the aged care, as I understand it, there's very, very various models. Uh, you put in your bonds, and uh, the government gives so much. It gives a pension to the people who are attending and that's paid off to the, to the aged care uh, accommodation owner. Um, I'm, look, it's not an area I put a lot of emphasis on, so I couldn't exactly answer that part of the question. But as far as using AMP to do it, I don't think I would. Yeah. Frankly, I think AMP looks quite OK at the moment. Fundamentals shape up. Dividend yield's not bad. Future growth is OK. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be selling AMP to buy something in the aged care sector, of which I am, uh, am not familiar of any standout ones that are in that uh, area at the moment. So uh, I guess the first part of your question, I wouldn't be selling AMP to do whatever uh, you wish to do. The second so. part of the question. Carl, I'm obviously, because I'm sort of with Michael on that, I think AMP is the wrong funding source. I'd probably ask the question though around aged care stocks that, you, that, that are taking your fancy. There will be a few because there are some very much on the chart level that have really, really caught a lot of people's eye um, and have got some form of excitement because of it. Yeah, I think probably uh, EHE, Istia, yeah. is, yeah. Uh, is definitely my pick in that sector. I um, tipped it last time I was on the show, it's done quite well. Uh, contrasting that, uh, I'll come clean on one. I actually, we, yeah, we did the buy, hold, sell. I said to sell Ramsey 
last time I was on the show, and that was a terrible call. Mm -hmm. uh, because that actually looks very, very good right now. Um, I think Ramsey looks good. I think uh, Estia looks good. Um, uh, Jay Japara. Yeah, that's the other one. Uh, looks very good. Um, Cockley, I think, looks very good. Uh, I know they're not always aged healthcare. As far as A and P goes, you, I look, I'm going to have to disagree with you guys uh, yep. respectfully. I, I, I think you can swap out A and P from your portfolio uh, if you want to look at the same space. Uh, same space, Magellan uh, flagship MFF, I think, is the is the pick there. Uh, why hasn't A and P run with all those other funds management uh, companies? I, I think that's a bit of a black flag, and I, I don't think it's too late to switch into one of those better performers. And on that, we'll uh, we'll take a very very short break. Are into the last. 15 minutes of the show, please. Please pick up those phones, 1300 30 34 35. See you after this short break. And welcome back to the program. If you have a question about shares, please pick up those phones, 1300 34 35. Email us in at yourmoney at skynews.com.au or hashtag YMYC. We are into the last 15 minutes, so thank you for all of those that have called in so far. It's been a very good show. Let's finish it off with a, with a couple more callers. We've got John from Melbourne. Hello, John. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. How can I, I help you tonight, John? Uh, look, I've got a self-managed super fund with uh, um, Woodside in it. I rely on the dividends, uh, fully frank dividends, and uh, I've, I've noticed the consensus, uh, the Allen's consensus, seems to be that the the dividends for Woodside are going to sort of half in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether it's a good idea to sell the Woodside shares and buy Medibank Private. Okay. We've got a 3% uh, uh, dividend uh, yield. So you're looking at Woodside Petroleum for Medibank Private because of the dividend yield? Is that the way the question is going, John? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, good question, because obviously it's a, it's a bit of a different industry in terms of what you're looking at. They're moving out of well, oil and gas and moving well, Medibank, into... Medibank Private's got a 3% uh, yield. Mm -hmm. and and uh, it's fully franked, and it looks as though it's uh, you know on the on the up. Can you advise me, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very interesting question because obviously that is a lot of the questions that you get out of self-managed super funds is obviously the the income play. Woodside Petroleum obviously changed their their current strategy last year to say that their payout ratio would be 80%. It's why it all of a sudden out of nowhere a growth stock became overnight an income play. Uh, and the the issue with it obviously is that it is very much exposed to the oil price, and therefore although you can pay 80% of your net profit, if your net profit's been halved by the oil price, then right. clearly your, your income play isn't there. So I'm going to go with the first part of the question because before I go to Carla on the technical sides, I want to go to you, Michael, in terms of the actual Pacific question was, would you sell Woodside Petroleum and look at Medibank Private on a yield basis? I would uh, look at selling Woodside because I'm not favourably disposed to the oil and gas sector, full stop, yep. uh, in, in, in light of my earlier comments about Sandos, Oil Search, you name them. Uh, I think other blue chip mid cap stocks are preferable uh, to Woodside. Medibank, totally different stock. I think Medibank doesn't look too bad actually. It made its announcement yesterday about the link up with HealthScope. Uh, uh, so uh, it's now got I think 70% of the hospitals lined up uh, for its uh, health fund. That to me looks okay. Its, its growth I think is okay. Dividend yield is, is I think a 3 to 4% yep. fully frank. Woodside might be a bit more but look dividend yields can be high because the share price has gone down not because they're paying out more in dividends so I think that's what uh, the caller has got to really bear in mind so there are plenty of other things other than Medibank I might say but if you mention specifically yes I'd do it okay yeah and that was gonna be my question is that would Medibank be your choice not necessarily but it's okay yep. yeah yeah Carl, I'm going to come to you on the second part of the question, which sure. obviously is to look at it from a chart perspective and how you'd obviously then look at it. Would you go out of Woodside, go into Medibank on the chart aspect of it or uh, look elsewhere? Yeah, look, I don't think either of them look that fantastic at this point in time. Uh, Woodside looks worse than Medibank Private, but I don't think that's a reason to switch. Um, if, you know, John's uh, main goal is income, and I understand that. You know, that's a lot of investors are in that category um, where they just want some certainty as... Is, and, and you know, you, you could argue, well, I want some certainty of income, but it'd be nice that your capital's protected as well. In that regard, I think, John, uh, get the... Uh, I know they replayed this show uh, numerous times. Uh, get the recording of this show. Um, you mentioned Aristocrat Leisure earlier on. I think that's a fantastic-looking stock. Uh, I'm sure the dividend yield is greater than 3%, Michael. Um, the stocks that uh, Michael and I have picked tonight, they've said, look, this is a great one, get onto it. 
just get onto your ASICS website, check out the dividend yield, and you heard all that's 3%. If any of the ones that we've talked about that we like tonight have a better than 3% yield, well, there's your answer right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, just purely from that question, purely from that question, if, John, it very much sounds like you are looking for income plays, then obviously you're looking for a, a conservative name in terms of, of what you're doing, and therefore you, you are probably already removing anything outside the top 50, yeah. um, let's be honest, in terms of that, because you want to have the, the certainty that earnings are, are, are somewhat assured. I mean, obviously we've talked about Santos, and that's still in the top 50. Um, but you would then look at something, even you could talk about Telstra again, if you are looking purely on an income play. And that's, that was the question. I agree that there are parts of Telstra that are no longer as exciting as they probably once were, but it is back at a yield of 5.5%. So that is the original part of the question was, what would I look at from Woodside over on a yield basis? If you want a 5% yield for a 5% yield, which is actually written into pretty much stone, Telstra may be your answer. Well. You may be right. Look, the one that I do like, though, if you're looking for reasonable growth, good dividend yield, 5% is the Bank of Queensland. Better than the four majors as far as its past performance is concerned, future growth. Dividend yield is 5%, I think, plus, I think, mm -hmm. fully frank. So if you're looking for dividend yield with OK growth, safety, Bank of Queensland for me. Telstra, the, the reason I, I'm not so enthusiastic about it, I know dividend yield is good, but its future growth next year I think is not going to be very good at all. Yeah, and I, so. I would agree. Uh, look, the reason I mentioned it is obviously we're trying to look at the income side of it, and mm. that was obviously the reason I did it. I think that's the best way to answer that, John. Very much have a look at everything we have spoken about tonight. Mm. And as Carl said, anything with 3% or more may be your answer than sort of the mm. maybe better bank, which is a little bit more flat in terms of earnings. Mm. Very much moving on to probably what will be the last quarter of the night. So we've got Alistair from Hawthorne. Hello, Alistair. How are you? How are you going, guys? Uh, well. Great panel. Great show. Very much enjoying your, your discussions. Thanks so much. Um, look, three stocks I want to have uh, a bit of advice on. Uh, two that I'm holding, Netcom, mm -hmm. uh, which I've held from about 50 cents. Yep. Uh, what's the target on it? Mm -hmm. uh, MBE, Mobile Embrace, uh, from 18 cents. What's the target there? Yes. And looking at BHP, what's the thoughts on value... Uh, medium to long term with BHP at present prices? Okay, good questions, Alistair. I will go with the BHP question last because I think that's going to be quite an interesting one. I very quickly want to touch on the first two, Netcom and obviously Mobile Embrace, purely from the technical level because that was obviously the levels that we were asking from. So, Carl, straight to you on those two only. Yep. Uh, let's have a look at Netcom and Mobile Embrace from the technical levels. Where would you see it? Uh, Netcom has had uh, the most amazing run. A uh, dollar fifty to three fifty in you know, half a dozen trading sessions. Uh, that's a pretty good run in anybody's books. Um, I don't think you need to get out necessarily right now, Alistair. Um, today wasn't the most convincing day, but uh, it's still certainly got a fair bit of momentum in today's uh, candlestick. I think now, though, having had such a great run, it's time to start to protect some of those profits. So, if you don't have already, I, I think you need to have a stop loss in the system uh, to protect uh, protect you from. A a, a, you know, a big pullback from here. I'd be running that sort of around about that 293, 294 level. Uh, it doesn't give you a lot of downside. It still gives you all the upside in the stock. And then I would just trail that higher, um, maybe under sort of the second from last day's low uh, as the stock continues to rise if it does rise. But I think you're probably more in uh, profit taking mode on Netcom than you are on, say, something like MBE, which I think really still looks very good right now. And I definitely want to stick with that one. Um, there's nothing really suggesting to me that uh, this is going to stop any time soon. Um, I think you can run a bit more of a, a wider stop there. It's a bit more of a volatile stock, so you don't want to get taken out unnecessarily. I don't think you need to have a stop loss in the market all the time. That's, different. That's not always my philosophy. I think there's times to put, put them on when you want to be protected and other times to give the stock a bit of room to move. I think Mobile Embrace is in that second camp. Give it a bit of room to move. I think you'll see 50 cents. Uh, Netcom, be a bit more aggressive with your, uh, your risk management. Mm -hmm. Alistair, I think that's probably the best way to answer that because they are very much a technical trading stock. I do want to mm -hmm. probably finish the show on, on the last half of the question because I think it is a very poignant question right now about where BHP is genuinely at um, fundamentally and also technically in terms of, of where you see it. Mike I'm going to start with you for the, the last sort of three minutes of the show. Okay. BHP is it value or is there a bigger underlying issue with the big Australian? To me, there is a bigger underlying issue. I don't think it's value. Just because the share price has gone down doesn't mean it's value. You've got to look at what its future is. Low, low oil prices, low iron ore prices, low coal prices, and the perfect storm with the dam burst over there in South America. Uh, look, even if it, it bounces up a little bit, 
over the course of the next year, unfortunately, I don't think BHP is going to be there. As I said, there's another 19 stocks in the top 20 you could look at, which in my view have probably got better prospects than BHP. Some people are very disappointed, gone down from 50 bucks down to below 20. You know, it, it's to me, I think there's other areas I'd rather put my money into that I think have got much better long-term growth, safe that and pay better dividends than BHP. For, finish with this, it's dividend yields only up because the share price has dropped from $30 to $20 in the last, in the last six months. Yep. Carl, it's on the technical level. Yeah, look, I don't think you can blame BHP from going from 35 to, to 20. It's not BHP's fault. BHP is an inanimate object. It has, it's, it's, it doesn't exist uh, as, a, as an entity, uh, as, a, as, a, as a living thing. So you can't blame BHP. The only person you can blame for losing money on BHP, unfortunately, as an investor, is yourself. Um, you've got every day that the market is open to uh, take that decision to get out. I don't think it's too late to get out. I do think there's more downside here, or at the best case scenario, it goes sideways for a long time. And the main reason for that, putting BHP aside, is I can't see any catalysts in the near term for commodities prices. Um, I'm not saying commodity prices will continue to plummet as they have been plummeting, although that is more likely than them rallying straight up. More than likely, you've got one, two, three years of basing out at these levels to get the supply demand imbalance back into equilibrium before it can start going up. And it could take a very long time for BHP to start to put in consistent rises again. Not to say you won't get your 10% up here or there. I just don't think you want to muck around with this one right now. Yeah, my 10 seconds, because that's all I've got left on this, is the four pillars are all four bears. And that's the way to summarise it. Copper, coal, iron ore and oil are all in a bear market, stuck in it, and therefore there's going to be more pain in BHP, unfortunately, than there will be upside in the short term. And I think that's the way to finish it right now. Unfortunately, it's more likely to be a teen-handled stock than a high 20s or $30 stock anytime soon. But fortunately, that's a fairly dour note to actually finish today's program on. Uh, it has been a very good show. So please, let's thank so much to our guests today. We've got Michael Heffernan from Philip Capital, Carl Capalunga from Investor Systems. To all of you that made the phone calls, emails and the tweets, thank you so much. Apologies to those that we didn't get to. We obviously ran out of time, but it has been a great program, as I said. And until next time, I'm Evan Lucas from IG. Thanks for your company. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.